every time. Happen. What's Thank up, everybody? God Welcome to another ever. episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes. As always, I'm here with Chuck Moon and Scott Manley. And today I'm here with <laughs> Rick Avery, uh, whose his co-writer is uh, Drew Partlow. And uh, today we were talking Check about out. space oh. opera. I looked him up season on four, episode yeah, thirty-seven. See, What's somebody's that? gonna somebody's gonna come in here and really believe that stuff. No, there we should have all done our names backwards. Just all of them. Done backwards. <laughs> uh, welcome, 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 everyone, uh, to another episode of Live. Uh, it is Monday, September twenty-third, and we what is this? Where uh, episode Gazillion. Monday. We're, I mean, we're almost twenty third. We're almost out of September, guys. Can you like this year's over? It's over. Yeah. We're the, we're a hundred days left in the whole year. It's, yeah. it's over. Where do, I'll just forget it. Speaking of how many days are in the year, well, we're gonna get to this here in a little bit. But Rick, you made a post on uh, Facebook earlier. Seven hundred thousand words written this year so far, twenty nineteen, with yeah. 100, 100 days That's left in the year. That's insane. I, mean, I didn't even really keep track of it either. It just sort of snuck up on me. Well, congrats. That's a pretty freaking awesome number. That's a nice thing to have sneak up on you. Yeah. <laughs> There's other things you can have sneak up in it that are not fun at all. <laughs> we talked about a lot of about the story. No, yeah. no. Well, and there's been a unilateral decision now tonight on Keystroke Medium. Uh, we are no longer allowing Scott story time. <laughs> uh, story time with Scott has been permanently banned from the show. And we henceforth, any mention of any further Scott talk time shall be labeled. Yeah, Every time I was, and there we were. Yeah. Surrounded. And, and then the stories were there. there we were. A bad one. It's going no place. Cut, cut it right off. Uh, so we're going to get into the conversation. We, we, we talked a lot about um, uh, different genres of uh, storytelling and um, movies and books and whatever over the last couple of weeks. We've hit uh, superheroes. We've hit uh, what else have we talked about? Um, well, we ripped apart Star Wars, and I think that was one of my, probably my favorite episode of all time. Um, the Expanse. Uh, we, did the Expanse. We, did, we did talk about The Expanse. Um, yes, you? we did. Uh, we're going to talk about space opera tonight, and a lot of the thing, uh, I think the conversation is going to revolve around the Commonwealth saga. Um, we we talked a little bit about it in uh, the Facebook chat, and then uh, Rick and I talked about it a little bit offline. Um, and we've had Peter F. Hamilton on the show twice now uh, to talk um, about his uh, Salvation series, and also I can't remember the first book we had him on for Night Without Stars, I think, which was uh, his second book in the duology. Uh, the abyss with dreams it was i think is uh ending to the the commonwealth saga as we know it anyway uh but his books um pandora star and judas unchained are, are by far my favorite space opera books of all time um and uh, i don't think that we could talk about the genre without talking about those books um first let's talk a little bit about what we've been going uh doing this week um rick you've been obviously pounding away at the keyboard all year. Have you done anything uh, interesting this week that kind of um, piques your attention or you think is interesting? Well, early last week, I finished uh, Wholesale Slaughter 6, um, Redemption Shadow. So it'll be out October 8th. Congrats. Um, and I'm almost done with the third book in the uh, Broken Arrow Mercenary Force trilogy that me and Drew are doing together. So that's what I've been working on. So that, does that wrap the whole trilogy then or? It does. It does. I mean, we might go back to it because it's a pretty open-ended world, but this is going to wrap up the story for these characters. Uh, Redemption Shadow, uh, coincidentally, it was actually the title of my third book in the Terra Nova series for the entire life of the draft until like two weeks before we published <laughs> the book. Um, it was it was called Redemption Shadow all the way through, and then right when we went to publish, we changed it to Wings of Redemption. because I thought You changed it. A little, I did. I did. You did? Well, it's a good thing you changed it because I'd have to go back and change mine. Then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, Josh. You have to change your title now. Everybody change all your titles. Uh, what about you, Chuck? What have you been up to this week? Uh, same old, same old, man. I'm still plugging away on the uh, Urban Fantasy Jack Dark series for Athon. Um, I've had a couple of my uh, few but uh, ravenous fans getting on me about... Um, the third Brace Cordova book. So I've started revisiting that to try and get it finished. It's like 
75% of the way there. It's just things happened. Um, so I got that going. The, I had to resend my um, Brace Cordova short story to Lauren today for the anthology for some reason. Um, and taking care of these kids who keep me on my toes all the time. That's pretty much fills up my days. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, we, uh, we just lost our daycare or we're in the process of losing our daycare. And so that's going to be me for the for foreseeable future is. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, especially me. at the ages you've got, man. Yeah. That's, that's a full-time wow. job. Yeah, I've had to cut, cut back up. significantly on uh, some projects with this kind of disappointing, um, but uh, also kind of freeing at the same time. So uh, speaking of which, Scott, what have you been up to this week, man? Um, I finished uh, Reaper 6, the Wrath, Wrath of the Reaper today, about five minutes before we did our Facebook thing and got it so That was finished awesome. as, and through the, through the final edits going to the content editor. I'll have probably a few more changes to make tomorrow, which is good because it's got to go up on pre-order. It's got to be up on Amazon by the 25th. So always cutting it close. And uh, going to work on my Galaxy's Edge book a little bit. Maybe wrap up some other projects and whatnot. And that's about it. Uh, one, of, one of our friends, Josh and I's friends, retired from the police department, his old boss in the bomb unit last week. So that was interesting. Everybody that's like my age is all retiring. So I feel like I should retire and just write space opera. You should. You should. It's the right retirement. thing to do. His it's retirement the photo. Right thing to do. His retirement photo was him in the bomb suit holding the remote detonator. Um, probably, mm, I would say probably like fifty feet away from the wall of fire when it went off. Yeah. And basically, the, the wall of fire is basically. Um, uh, it could be six to seven uh, milk gallon milk jugs that are filled about yay high with uh, uh, diesel fuel and um, then wrapped in debt cord and they all go off at the same time. And so you get this big like Hollywood esque flame of uh, brilliance. And explosion. was he walking? Was he walking away from it? He yeah. was yeah. looking at the He was, the <laughs> he was like, <laughs> and the flames went off behind him, and we should find the picture and put it and put it up there. But yeah, they yeah. They, they put it on his retirement photo because like there's elevators and they always put up you know so and so retired after forty seven thousand years of service from right. Wichita, you know, and um, it always looks like somebody's kind of like happy to leave, but they're kind of like really tired because they've been working for the city for 50 years <laughs> and they run down and, and, and uh, Shane's picture. He's literally, he's got this cackling mad, mad expression on his face. Like he's laughing and he's blowing stuff up and there's a wall of fire and he's in his bomb suit. And it's amazing. Cool. So yeah, I snuck a story on you guys. It did. Wasn't you did. Disgusting. It didn't involve an emergency room though. It so didn't involve emergency right. rooms or car stops. So you're right. pretty, there you go. Pretty safe. Uh, speaking of Scott's sixth book, it's also the sponsor for tonight's episode, wrath of the reaper, a military sci-fi epic. The Last Reaper Book Six. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the show. It's on pre-order for three ninety nine, and you guys need to buy it seriously because I, it's the right thing to do. It. I mean, if you don't watch it, you're just going to have to stop. a lot of health benefits too from <laughs> it, I heard. Yeah. Um, I have been trying desperately to finish Echoes of Valor. Um, we had to push back the launch uh, from the first. It's now the 29th. Which we um, learned you can do. I didn't which know. which we learned you could do um, on uh, Amazon pre-orders. They've changed their uh, the way they do things, and so now authors can have years of pre-orders or one year, one year of pre-order instead of ninety days. Uh, but you can also adjust your launch day one time during the launch cycle of that book. Um, so if you set a pre-order and you're like me and you get to the ending and the ending is messing with you, like really horribly messing with you, you can push it back. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the ending of that, but, uh, but it will be finished. It's because you're a perfectionist and you want it to be awesome, which well, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. That's right. Sorry yeah. about that. I apologize. <laughs> Damn you for oh, look, at, look at Josh. Look, look, at the, look at this comment. It came in on YouTube. It's not in the, it's not in the, it's not in stream yard yet. Come on stream yard. It's not there yet. Because <laughs> what? That's right. What's with the candlelit atmosphere? Well, that's just how. Sure. That's how my day is. <laughs> I had okay. So Scott told a story in the pre-show. Oh, no. we, we will not repeat. <laughs> Involves aromas. No, nope. nah, we're not going to repeat it. 
it's not to be repeated. And I had to light a candle for all <laughs> all the people that had to sit through that story. Um, yeah. in the history of it's traumatizing. You should have been there and heard it the first time. It was <laughs> <laughs> so bad. Yeah. We should buy, buy, like record the pre show and then like charge people to like Patreon. Yeah. Uh, so Rick, you you're, you're launching your sixth book in the whole wholesale slaughter series, Redemption Shadow. It comes out, out uh, October eighth. This will be uh, your twenty eighth published book uh, out. Um, right now, you have twenty six, right? I have twenty six. That will be twenty seven or twenty eight, depending on when broken at broken era <laughs> broken era mercenary <laughs> force. I love it. <laughs> I was about to call it broke ass mercenary force, but. <laughs> um, but so, the two of them are out pretty close together, so it'll be twenty seven and twenty eight. That's amazing. Uh, all since uh, two thousand eleven, when you published Duty on Our Planet, um, and back then you were really trying to mess with the algorithms. Apparently, he published one book, and then the next day he published the next book. Uh, he didn't want to do the thirty day sale. He, you know, I, I didn't have hours. anybody tell me what was the right thing to do. Thirty minute sale. <laughs> thirty minute <laughs> algorithm. That's right. So back in the dark ages of two thousand eleven. I had, I didn't even know what Kboards was. I don't or think Kboards is thing. Kboards still a thing. Kboards is still a thing, yes, but I don't know if they were around back then or not. I tried to go there recently. Thought to go old school, do some market research, and I just I think I died a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like going on, it's like going on Twitter. You're like, ah, oh, this was fun for five seconds. Except like a more, except you feel like you're in the '90s or something reading a web page, you know. Because it's oh, that, that that hurts. I read a lot of web pages. Oh, no. oh, oh we my dad and I were talking about that this morning, and I and I yelled at him because he he would never spend the money to get the fifty six k modem. He, we were at like fourteen four for years. And I'm like, Dad, please, can we get the fifty six k? It's going to make our experience so much better. Right? No, well, we were stuck on fourteen four. I think Chuck is stuck on a fourteen four modem right now. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. My camera's acting weird. I think I'm going to log out and try and get You've back got in. got like a really cool, mysterious, like, yeah, but, but your is good. Right? because I am cool and mysterious. If you keep that, that's actually pretty dramatic. Yeah, that's, that's very dramatic. <laughs> you look <laughs> like you're tired of all our crap, Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Done with your shenanigans. That's you yeah. never, the you never earned Papa Chuck's ire. <laughs> <laughs> the pre show stories burned out. I might just leave it there and just do the rest of the show in audio. I really think you should. That's what I'm going to do then. All right. I think we'll just make it like the like. Now you won't know if I'm flipping you off. No, we're gonna do this. We're just gonna leave it <laughs> like that the whole show. This is how we're gonna do the show. The most serious <laughs> episode ever. <laughs> we're on. Somebody take a screenshot of that. Somebody take a screenshot of that and send it to me. I'm gonna use that as the show. That's gonna be the show poster for. It's gonna be the show poster for tonight's episode. I have, Papa Chuck is not amused. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna make memes out of Papa Chuck. Right here, one more time. Is somebody take a screenshot? One more time. Oh, Ooh. that's hilarious. That's awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, please press on. <laughs> what are we discussing? Uh, space opera. We're talking about space opera tonight. Um, I, have you, you say, I, what do you think about that, Chuck? And then you put his face up. There yeah, all right. Everyone, let's, let's, let's Chuck with it. What do you think about space opera, Chuck? Oh, talk about it. Bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not amused. Oh my gosh, that's awesome! This is the best show ever. <laughs> so, whenever you want to make a point, Josh, just make yeah, it. just oh, we'll just, just click zoom in. <laughs> uh, so I know that I've read it. I've read it several times. Rick, you've read it. Scott, I think you've read it. Chuck, have yeah. you ever read the Pandora Star uh, Judas Unchained duology? No. Did he call it duology? Yeah, he does call it a duology. Um. So these books are set. Uh, obviously really, really far in the future. They start actually kind of a near future thing. And it kind of threw me off a little bit when I first started it because it starts uh, as a uh, team of scientists are landing on Mars for the first time. And they get on Mars and uh, they they disembark their uh, little shuttle and they're going on to uh, explore. And then as soon as they like basically walk off the plane, this guy steps through this portal, Ozzy the Isaac. Hole in the universe. It, it, yeah, the the, the, the biggest in like his homemade uh, suit. Yeah, it was Mars suit. suit. Steps steps through the portal and he goes, "Hi guys," uh, and then it fast forwards like thousands of years in the future. Um, hundreds, hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Uh, oh, that's right, because the uh, the Void trilogy is like twelve hundred years in front of that. Um, but so. 
this book has um, lots of worlds, lots of different worlds, lots of cool tech. Um, Gore Benelli is really cool as a as a character because he he he's almost an entirely artificial person. Um, and he's got, almost twentieth really century character in the book, I think. Yes, he is. Um, you've got uh, uh, genetic engineering. You've got uh, aliens, and I think Strange. some of the best written aliens uh, ever in a book. Morning Light Mountain. Morning Light Mountain. Um, when you get to his chapter, and you don't even get to his chapter to like the middle of the book, and you start reading, you're like, what is going on here? And you don't even know. He doesn't even explain nothing. He just starts, oh, here's Morning Light Mountain. And you don't care about this pool of amoeba. Right. Well, you go from his, his basically his creation to um, through a millennia, basically, of his lifetime until uh, present day. And um, it's just, he starts like poking and prodding humans and he's like, why is he making that noise? <laughs> Rips off his arm and you're like, Oh God. Um, check the Facebook group. Uh, okay. Why am I checking the Facebook group? I, um, I remember, I remember that scene and most of the stuff about morning light mountain. Cause I was working out at new market as a part time and I was listening to it in one headphone. Cause I'd put one earphone in so I could like hear my police radio with the other one. And I was walking the mall. Yeah. Over and over again. And I walked it like, 20,000 steps to a part time. That's right. Yeah, that was. I was a mall cop. If I had a segue, it would have been more official, but I didn't. It's like a low budget mall cop. Uh, so, Rick, what, when you when you read that book and you and you write military, military sci fi, but you also have a, kind of a flair for space opera as well. Um, when you read that book, what do you pull out of it? What's your favorite uh, character from that book? And can you can do you have a favorite scene or a favorite uh, um, part of the book that uh, that you like more than others? Um, both books together or just just the first yeah. one? Yeah, both books together. Well, my favorite scene in both books together is Gore Bernelli. Spoilers: Killing Bruce McF McFoster, I think the last name. Oh is. yeah, mm -hmm. the, the Star Flyer agent. Yeah, that was just one of those scenes. Probably the one most in both books where you just go, "Yes," <laughs> you know. Yes, that, that was like because you thought he was going to kill Justine. Yep. I didn't think any way she was going to get out of it, and then Gore is just there and toys with him because he's been around for hundreds of years and has the most money in the in the galaxy and. and Equipped with every weapon you can think of. Yep. So that I found that the most uh, hell yeah moment in there. Also, when um, Nigel Sheldon had his ship fire the Nova bomb into uh, through the wormhole. Oh, that, yep. Right. Morning Light Mountains forces. That was pretty cool too. I and wonder. The reaction, the reaction by Morning Light Mountain when it happened was very, very well written. I think my favorite character is um, probably uh, Paula Mayo. Um, but also, I, I like you say, Ozzy is kind of a dick, but, which he is. Um, but I really like his character. I mean, he, once you get past the whole, like, I'm going to just roam around um, the story the whole time. Uh, once you can get past that, I think that it, it's a really, really good book or a good part of the book. I, I, I like that part of the book. I like his exp explorations. I just found him to be a huge irresponsible butthole for actually doing it. That is he, true. And, and you look back, he didn't really accomplish anything they couldn't have done on their own. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That checks out. A lot, yeah, he's a lot. Is Josh frozen? No, I'm. I'm just trying to do oh, something. I'm, that would be horrible. If I've got. Share, I've got something to share. Hold on. You gonna share something from Morning Light Mountain, or yeah. <laughs> this is what we're gonna share? <laughs> <laughs> oh crap! I closed it. Hold on. It happened. We live in a world of the technology to do that sort of stuff. So hold on. I I didn't do that. Sorry about that. I, I should have left it up. That's yeah. Hilarious. It's they're, they're both massive books, and so you know I go through. I have my favorite parts, but I'm having a hard time remembering <laughs> specific scenes and stuff. Well, that's my problem yeah. with it. Is I think it should have been four books. I oh, think it yeah. would be much better as four books. I was surprised when it was done. I was like, what, there's not more? Because you really get, you know, if you make it to the end of two books that size, you're invested. You'd like to have more, in my opinion. You know, it. Um, I read the, um, what was the series? The, uh, the series before that. Uh, the uh, Night's Dawn the Trilogy. Yes, the Night's nice Dawn Trilogy. 
Well, actually, and, it was in the U.S., I think it was six books or whatever, but in England, yeah. it was a trilogy. Right. Big, massive trilogy. <laughs> I don't know that Peter F. Hamilton's ever re- written a small book. The, the smallest books he's ever written are the uh, um, the police procedural... Uh, gosh, now I don't even remember the name of that series, but it's a... Uh, it's a like near future kind of cyberpunk, and even those are are probably a hundred thousand words. So that, that's interesting. We're talking about space opera. Is that normal for space opera to be that long? Yeah, not not nearly. I mean, you're talking about for a trilogy. You're talking about a million and two words, probably a million and three yeah. words for a trilogy. Um, the only other, the only other space opera I can think of that's that long is the Expanse. Yeah, but that's several by uh, yeah. several books. I mean, they're each pretty long, but nothing approaching. Peter F. Hamilton long. Yeah. He's, he writes epic fantasy long, except it's science fiction. Right. Um, I, so I read those, I read those books first and then I came over to, uh, Pandora star and Pandora, Pandora star is, um, it's, it's true space opera. I mean, a lot of people write space operas, but not actually really space. Opera. Mind star rising is crack neuron said that's his, that's his police procedure of mind star rising. That's a great, great mystery. So what makes it space up? Let's talk about that. Um, I think just the 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 scope, like the vastness of it, like um, the, the he's got different worlds. All those worlds are connected by wormholes, but they're not they're not actually wormholes like we think of wormholes. Um, it's actually kind of a more economic version of of space travel because you don't actually go in space. And it that was interesting to me. It was the first space opera book that I read ever that nobody ever went to space really except like halfway through uh, the book. So they were developing the ships yep. to go. Yeah. But the thing is they didn't need them because yeah. they had, they had the wormhole generators. And so everything was connected by trains um, through um, what they call, I think they call it, uh, no, the communications was zero with wormholes, but basically it was, it was trains and all those trains were connected. Um, all those planets were connected by wormholes and these, big transfer stations. Did uh, you ever read Robert Heinlein's Tunnel in the Sky? No, uh uh-uh. uh. 1950s, it's same same deal. With same, trains? With worm when though with wormholes connecting wormholes. everything. And nobody yeah. went to space the whole book. Nice. Um well I think I mean you have epic big planets um that you actually get down into what's happening in the planet. You, you, you follow these characters around in such a way that um, you experience um, the worlds and not just name. Like, I think there's a lot of books, including some of my own that um, are like, Oh yeah, they go to this planet here and they're from such and such here. But we have actually, we don't ever know what those places are like, what life is like on them. um, What makes them distinct from other places. Um, Yeah each world yeah and like even even with paulo mayo's home planet um that was interesting they they make mention of it through the books and then we finally get to go there um and it's just the scope and vastness of it is just kind of incredible and um somebody told me once that for it to be space opera you have to go to another planet and so that would be the difference between yeah. like a lot of science, like science fiction, like near fiction, it could all happen on Earth or all happen right. on whatever planet. The part of the key elements of space opera is, and they and they said on a ship, but looking at Peter of Hamilton's work and the other examples we had, that's not the case. But right. space travel of some sort is usually involved in space opera. Yeah, I definitely. Think. I think aliens are a key part of it. Oh, I agree, hundred percent. Without aliens, but I think it's. Real space opera as aliens. I think you're right. I agree. I think, and, or, or there's definitely potential. Any, any space opera that you, that I can think of, whether it's a TV show or a movie or a book, um, they all had a a number of aliens um, that were distinct. Like Babylon Five is is the one that comes to my mind. Um, Farscape. Farscape. Although I never really watched Farscape, I, I I think I I tried to watch it, and I don't know I don't know what what it was about Farscape that I didn't I didn't latch onto. I had to have my I had to have my my partner at work recorded on VHS, and I would go home and watch it because I always worked when <laughs> it was on. Was I nice. I remember recording things off. My yeah. mom actually. And it was always really oh. crappy quality. Yeah. I guess Stargate, Stargate would qualify as space opera. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, 
uh, it, Stargate is almost um, Stargate is almost like what uh, the wormholes in Pandora Star is because they're they're land based for the most yeah. part. The the Stargates are are land. So would Stargate be a subgenre of space opera? It seems like there it's a little bit unique because it's it's got a strong military tone because it's always kind got... of military science fiction is also, but. I mean, they go to a bunch of different worlds and meet a whole bunch of different aliens. Yeah. I would say it would be space opera with military people in it and not actually military sci-fi. I think you can make a distinction between those two genres. Um, well, let's, let's break down aliens for a minute. Like you can have like kind of like Star Trek Deep Space Nine aliens where they just have like ridges on their Do nose. Clay ridge. Ridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or you can have like Babylon five aliens or, um, pen, uh, like, like morning light mountain, uh, aliens. They're where totally they're, incomprehensible to humans because they don't the think act or value right. the same thing. Or the expanse aliens, right. Where we don't even know really who they are. Well, where I'm at in the books, we don't, um, but they've, you know, obviously created this, this enormous, uh, techn technological transit system, communication system, uh, you know, Babylon Five, I think, is the first space opera TV series that that really went over the top with aliens um, in their design. Like Star Trek did a little bit, but Star Trek was kind of limited in the fact that they um, they used humanoids for the most part as as their alien duel. Uh, hey, consistently, Christie's watching. If you guys didn't know, look at this. Check it out. Hey, y'all, look at it's Rick. <laughs> Hi. It's been a while Welcome. that we've seen consistently Christy in the chat. Welcome back. Um Babylon 5, though, I think like you've got the Vorlons, you've got the Shadows, um, you've got uh, of course all the 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 regular looking humanoids, but then you've got um uh the hum the creatures that have to live in their own atmosphere. Um and uh I just thought that you know, and you could tell where they spent their money at, right? They, they, you, they spent their money on production value for the aliens and for the CG, because there's, uh, there's a, a lot to be said about their low budget space station sets, especially when they're running into the walls and you can see like the walls shaking because they accidentally hit it. And they're like, oh, yeah, like cardboard. Yeah. I rewatched the first season recently. And there's a scene near the end of the first season where you can see one of the sound guys standing there, with a microphone in it, hanging off of it, dressed in like modern clothes. Well, they were so was supposed to be alone on on uh, Babylon Four or whatever it was. Nice, <laughs> nice. I, I'd, I'd read some place or seen where they in the original Star Trek where they had to make up props and they were like, it would bring like a chrome salt shaker. This looks sci-fi ish. This yeah. could be a communicator. Yeah. You know? Uh, so what, what do you guys think? Uh, what, what are your kind of, what are your favorite aliens when it comes to space opera? And then why are they your favorite? Hmm. Well, you're going to have, I like the, Kazin, the Kazin from Larry Niven. Oh, even from though, uh, ring world. Well, yeah, originally they were in ring world, but I mean, they, they had the man, I don't even know how to pronounce it right. Man, Kazin or man, Zen war series the tiger people, which is kind of a cliched alien. They're, they're cat people, but I just like, I liked them. I thought they were written in a way where they could be the enemy and you'd still kind of think they were cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when, and when was that written though? Seventies. I want to say, Yeah, I mean, it's a 60s. little bit, it's a little bit less cliche when you did it, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. I think we were talking about that earlier today about like uh, Ender's Game and how that was actually a lot more original when it first came out compared to now. It's like it's like an obvious concept. But so aliens, what's your favorite alien, Josh? Oh man, I think I think my favorite aliens. Um, it, I'm really partial to the Vorlons on on um, Babylon Five. I really liked their um not only their presentation but just kind of the the mysterious um i don't even it's hard to describe they when you finally get to the end of the arc and you figure out what they're doing it makes sense but i i just liked kind of how they um were this really kind of um 
powerful um unknown concept um that that people were just like oh yeah they're the vorlons and they're kick ass um i i love when everybody saw him as like the god of their of their uh religion right armor yeah exactly um i'm trying to think if there's another one that I mean, Morning Light Mountain Off. Obviously, when you we talked about him earlier, because he's just such an original, um, he's such an original villain that just does not take on any human tropes at all. Like, he doesn't have any human any human value systems, whether they're good or bad. Because most aliens, they have a human centric value system. It's just like the evil; they're evil or good. Right. Um, like Lord, morning light mountain would like wipe out an entire planet and it like, um, destroyed the atmosphere and yep. annihilated. And it's the only thing that makes sense to morning light mountain is, an, is completely obliterating all competition without any exception. Right. And that's its moral code. And the humans like trying to negotiate with it. It's like, that's really not going to work because they don't think the same. Right. Um, and I think, it, I can't think of any other alien actually, uh, maybe, the shadows from Babylon five, maybe, um, but any other alien that was like the, the venerable antagonist that you could not negotiate with, like the Terminator, he cannot be reasoned with, but, <laughs> but, but not for, a, not for a reason that he was just evil, but that was like, that's just his being like, that's his, um, existence. It's not that it's evil or, bad or yeah for him it's just this is my life like this is what i do it's not evil or bad for me and you can't i mean that there's no reasoning with that because he doesn't have any other ulterior motives he doesn't have like aha i want to conquer the world and and have it be mine it, it's not it's just this is what he does yeah um i like he recently christy says that the octopuses are aliens uh, because they have good. three hearts and their stomachs are in their heads which they have an eight lobe brain they have yeah. a what brain? They have like eight. an eight little brain or something. They have they have like huge yeah. brains. They have a brain for each arm, sort of, or something like that. Somebody, I can't remember. We were talking about it the other day. It's that crazy because screen. you, well, maybe I'm thinking of something else. But I'm like, like, okay, octopus. I was thinking of um, what are those um, jellyfish. I was thinking of jellyfish. Um, Same thing. Probably don't also octopus have like beaks or is that squid? That's squid. Squid. Barta today says Doctor Who has some crazy aliens. I never actually watched Doctor Who. I watched it when it's I was a Tom kid. Baker. It's what? I said I watched the ones with Tom Baker way back in the day. Isn't there, I think there's they got like, the, they a got the big hair. Time. Yeah, the one with the with the perm. Yeah, that that's the one. That's that's the Doctor Who I remember from growing up, and I haven't watched it since then. So I watched like the next guy after Tom Baker, and when they went away from him after just like two seasons. I'm like, ah, I'm done with it. Yeah. I can't take it. This isn't James Bond. <laughs> what, uh, what about you, Scott? What are your favorite aliens? You know, I was, I was thinking of some of those things in my first thought. And actually, I don't know, cause they're not really antagonists, but like, I think like, um, um, oh, the Vulcans and, and oh, the aliens yeah. that are, because they build strong characters, you know, cause like you got Spock and all these things and they have, they have these different character building things and they, they, they bring a lot to the story, you know, um, so, or like the Klingons or any of those, just the ones that are used a lot that we know more about because their, their cultures and stuff are, their made up cultures are brought into the story. So I like them. I like, I like to go and see stories from their perspective from their worlds would be cool i think someday i think some of the aliens while on on star trek while they were obviously just humanoid and yeah. i mean that's what their budget was they their their um so civilizations usually were really kind of created in depth like had a a cool like a lot of them had cool backstories a lot of them had like like uh, the sort of Kalis and the klingon empire and and all those different um backstories that you have for that i think that that is cool um oh chuck's back hey chuck hello i don't know how long you were waiting he was, he was in the green room <laughs> i was in the green room, <laughs> in the room. Star, trek, up. star trek's non-human aliens tended to be like energy clouds or Things right. they could animate. Totally incomprehensible. Right. 
And I, I, I we're I don't I don't really dig those as much. They're just like they're just so incomprehensible. It's hard to connect with them. Although Morning Light Mountain was different because as Nayland and Morning Light Mountain was incomprehensible, but uh, Peter of Hamlin took you deep into its psyche and made it relatable, and I thought that was very fascinating. Well, I think you have to do that with aliens, though. I, mean, I like the Borg, too. Crack Neuron says, mm -hmm. I like the Borg. Oh, the Borg is really good. That's a good one. That's I actually think... my favorite, those two episodes uh, in Star Trek. Are the best of both worlds are my favorite two episodes of all time for Star Trek, when uh, Picard gets turned into Locutus. I think going back to uh, books that... Um... Larry Niven has some very interesting aliens in the Ringworld books. The the puppeteers are interesting. <clears throat> Act protectors. They have like motivations that are totally alien. I you know I, I wish that I I, I need. I'm mean, gonna I'm gonna probably alienate a lot of people like this. But I don't really like a lot of the classic science fiction um space opera like i i, I read ring ring world and i didn't really like it at all i have not read ring world yet i feel like a real loser I, <laughs> you know it, it was great first time i'll give it that like the book was probably groundbreaking and i think it was uh you know it was received obviously well he was a great writer um but but i came into science fiction well after those books had 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 their heyday and uh, I, I started reading people like my space opera was david weber and peter f hamilton like that's that's where i came into this so when i go back and i read the other stuff uh, it's i don't know I, not to say anything bad about larry niven uh i just don't i don't like the books it, they, they don't appeal to me i think i was still reading do you know what it, do you, can you put your finger on what it is that doesn't appeal to you because i'm exactly the opposite of you I read Heinlein, Niven, Clark, all those guys when I was young. And then late 80s-ish, early 90s-ish, I started getting more into fantasy. And I pretty much quit reading science fiction for the most part. And, I, and a lot of the stuff you guys talk about from the more modern era, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm actually like you. I read a lot more fantasy than I do anything else now. But um, specifically with Ringworld, um, I remember kind of thinking, what is the point? Um, like I remember them going to the world, but then they had all these crazy things happen while they were on the world. And it, it, it didn't really think, seem like there was any logical progression to the story. Like they were, you didn't see any kind of like linear plot kind of thing. Is that no. What yeah. It's, it's basically like they get there and then they're, they're walking across the planet and they go to this big mountain and then there's a flying building for whatever reason. And then, right. this, you know, it, it, I just maybe and maybe it was just because I I a different focus. It's almost right. like it's a world building. It's a lot like fantasy right. in that way. Is that it's yeah it wants to show you the, the setting. It's amazing. I mean, it was they, a, it was a they, were, they, were, they were doing like a you know a fantasy quest almost, except in a science fiction setting. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And they just it's, it's it's the way things were a lot though. I I read a lot of books back then, and a lot of them worked that way. Back then, you know, for people who wanted to show off the world they built, you know, they yeah. uh, just wanted to show you the aliens and show you yeah. the f strange places they were at. I mean, yep. I, when I read it as a kid, I was like, I don't know, 12 or something when I read it the first time. I, you know, it was fascinating to me. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is a lot of that stuff back then was in the era they wrote in. It was really more about the exploration of what was possible within a genre you know it right. wasn't so much about the the characters and the stories within that that setting but these writers were just saying hey look and then they would you know attach some sort of real world plausibility to it and it was more about kind of trying to expand uh, a reader's uh suspension of disbelief so that they could open up these different avenues for other people to come along and follow in their footsteps. They weren't doing that consciously, of course, but I think in a lot of ways, that's what a lot of the, what you, what we consider the classic science fiction writers now were actually doing, you know, that's you what could, readers were looking for readers were looking for right. an amazing, yeah. never imagined before imagined setting. Right. Cause you could look at guys movies. who were, I guess, I guess you'd call them contemporaries. They came a little bit after that guys like Jack L. Chalker, 
and guys like that who did tell the more uh, plot focused type stories. They j but they weren't doing as well as the, as like uh, uh, Niven and, and those guys because that were doing more of the exploratory type stuff. I think, and Niven, I think and, when Niven and Pornell teamed up. I think that was the best of both worlds because Pornell yeah. was very plot driven, yeah. whereas Niven was very character driven. When they got what together, was, I liked their books together. What was the that first big one? They I can't remember now. Chris Hammer. Yeah, that was it. That was a great one. I remember that yeah, one from back in the day. Space opera, but they also did um, uh, what's the one with the footfall, the alien invasion story. Yeah, I remember. I I know what you're talking about. I don't know if I ever read that one though. That's a great book. It's yeah. It's, I know what you're uh, talking it, about. It's one, of, it's one of the really only alien invasion books that I enjoy. What about okay? So did we obviously i missed a lot of this conversation so if i'm covering already fertile ground let me know but i mean have we really talked about what <laughs> have we defined space opera have we talked about what what what's the difference between a space opera and a military uh, sci-fi book i mean have we have we explored like just the basics of this i think we talked about it just briefly and then we got we got taken off on a tangent um do you want to try to define it for us chuck well, I mean, it depends on where you're coming from because, like, uh, pre 1970s, space, if you said something with space opera, it was actually an insult because mm -hmm. they were, it was, it was a way of saying it was a hackneyed, overtold, poorly written, you know, crappy story coming from the more literate types. Uh, but then in Doc the 70s, Doc Smith was one of the earliest space opera writers. Yeah. Smith, he, he well, and Smith. science fiction in general had kind of that uh, right, but then, similar type of reputation. Post that, uh, it started kind of coming on into its own as a genre, but basically, it's just, um, and we're gonna, I'm talking post 70s here. It, it's, it's a big, epic, colorful story with huge consequences and and lots of action and and, and adventure it's it's almost a, a a pulp adventure story with large uh large things at stake and that sort of thing set in space you know what it comes from, the, the the term comes from the old with the word they used to use for cowboy movies horse opera horse opera right and then it, which it, which was a trade-off from soap opera, from yeah. the dramatic stories that were mostly sponsored by soap companies or whatever. So, do you, think, do you think that kind of generalization, where it comes from, like those two different things we're talking about, coming from soap operas, coming from um, the kind of the westerns, do you think that's why nowadays it's well, now it's actually coming back around, but kind of in the '90s and the early 2000s, a, a lot of people were like, "Oh, I'm I'm writing a space opera," and they're like. Okay, but but are you really an author? Like, um, and science, it's kind of science fiction as as a whole too. They look at it as kind of a a subclass of writing. Do you think? Well, that's, I, that's why I, it came from those kind of roots. Genre, genre fiction in in general has been yeah. looked down for ever. You know, forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it depends on. Genre, but but sci fi genre though, because I don't think fantasy's ever been looked down on. As, oh sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it still is. Ask us, ask a mm -hmm. hardcore science fiction. Fan. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you right now when well, I'm talking about when, main, mainstream, dude. When Tolkien first wrote the Lord of the Rings, it was laughed at as children's drivel. I mean, it was not the classic that we see when it first came <laughs> out. It was, it was, it was very hammered. But I mean, over the decades, you know, and honestly, I think over the decades, what has made it more acceptable is the fact that so many people enjoy it. Right. You know, well, they probably read it and grew up with it. And right. And then generational you know, cause approval. Because really, a, a lot of what I consider space opera, like the space opera I like to write, are really just big space adventure stories, mm. a la uh, Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon or any of that stuff that originated back in the 20s and 30s. You know, to me, that's what space opera is. I mean, sure, you can have. You know, space operas reached a point, I believe, where it has its own subgenres because you can have like military space opera, or you can have what's that thing that uh, I think they call it romantic space opera, where it's it's Science it's a romance. 
Maybe that's it. But there's like a there's like a, a science fiction setting, but it's more about the the romance and stuff like that. And that kind of falls under that. Yeah. So Scott I mean, there's alien tentacle porn. Well, All right. it's Scott. Hey. Beaver Ooh. hero. You know, when, when you I tell the kind of pre show stories that Scott tells, you got to expect right. that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, you got to throw out some tentacle porn. Uh, but, speaking of tentacle porn, Wrath of the Reaper comes out <laughs> on September 29th, and it is our show sponsor tonight. It's the sixth book in the last Reaper series. There actually uh, are tentacles in that book. I'm just that out there. <laughs> by, by Scott Moon and Dave Cheney. Uh, it's on the line now when Helic Kane is. Allies search for a new home. Their Exodus fleet faces an ancient enemy right when a captured scientist unleashes deadly experiments. Uh, Alon? Alon ships? Alon. Alon scout ships are drawing the Exodus fleet into a trap. Uh, the disparate uh, civilizations must work together to move a massive broken down fleet into a new system while dealing with external threats and an internal crisis. Dr. Ares has attempted to revive an alien race through DNA splicing. Always a good idea. But instead of resurrecting the past, he's created unstoppable creatures of extraordinary power of doom. The last Reaper and his allies have no choice but to fight against his this new enemy, protect the Exodus fleet, and find a new home for thousands of displaced survivors. The only thing that matters now is winning the right to stay alive of doom. <laughs> That's Wrath of the Reaper, book six in the last Reaper series. Um, I don't know if I can blow up this cover. I probably can't, but the cover is fantastic. We showed book five's cover last uh, the last time. We talked about the Reaper series, and Book Five uh, is probably one of the coolest, coolest covers uh, I've ever seen for a book. Uh, and Book Six is no uh, different. Um, let me get the link here real quick. It's on pre-order right now on Amazon. Three ninety nine is the price, and right now you should go buy it because I told you to, and Scott wrote it. Yes, thank uh, you. Boom! There you go. Go pick it up right now. That's an order. Do it. Up to. Trying to get, How about that segue guy? I mean, it could could you could I have done any better job on the segue? You could tell me. It was pretty, it was pretty perfect. It was pretty, it was pretty, it was pretty damn good. good. It gave me chills. Okay, it really it's pretty did. good. I try this find... book or Papa Chuck will not be amused. <laughs> oh, I'm using that meme. Yeah, it's up there. Uh, the meme's gonna go viral. I was I don't know what happened to my camera, man? Everything just went crapola across my screen. I had to restart my whole rig. I don't know, but I appreciate it. I appreciate you for that. Now realize that I'm not using my my uh, webcam. I mean, this is my webcam's up here and my Mac. I wonder why you were like waving at your camera because I was going to take the camera and point it at the Reaper book um, cover on my wall, but I couldn't do it. Uh, I'm gonna maybe next show I'm gonna hook up like all three of my cameras, and so I'm gonna have three views of Josh just talking. (laughs) I'll do a show by myself and just talk to myself like what do you think Josh oh, I think that was very good Josh <laughs> uh, consistently Chrissy got it right 10 out of 10 on the segue um, <laughs> she gets gold stars for the episode I don't know who was first tonight I, I tried to go back uh, Rick, was Bill, Bill was first. who was first Bill Frisbee oh, Bill Frisbee good job Bill golf clap for Bill um all right, so we're talking about. Isn't it's definitely, yeah. Ooh, shots. Do I need shots? Oh yeah, Bill's got to take a shot. Um, so we were talking about space opera, but we're also talking about Rick's books and Rick's books. The wholesale slaughter series is doing phenomenally well. Um, and is this more of a mill sci-fi? If we're breaking down a genre, more of a mill sci-fi with a kind of a weeping space opera universe, or more of a space opera with uh, mill sci-fi in it? I'd say it's more mill sci-fi with space opera background. I mean, they're aliens, you know, and well, yeah, yeah, they're kind of aliens. The the oh. Juta, the bad guys in the last book are they're not humans; they're a created race, but they're alien to us. So I would say it's more mill sci-fi. It's got mechs too, which I like. Yeah, mechs mechs are a big part of it. it it's it's an it's a love letter to. BattleTech. If I'm really going to be honest. Sweet. Are are mechs are mechs their own genre or subgenre now? They should be if they aren't. 
I'm it's, pretty it sure feels they like, are. It feels like it's kind of its own genre. The, the yeah, I think I think there's a category for them on Amazon. No, I have to look now. If there isn't, there should be because I. Yeah. Think it's like they. What's crazy is they've got like like military space marine and space fleet which I, I don't understand how they make the distinction between space free and like there should be more military <laughs> more military subgenres than space marine and space fleet this just doesn't make any sense to me maybe i'm thinking of keywords or something it, it's know. probably a keyword yeah I mean, the one thing i the one thing about mechs is that when you look at them from any practical military point of view they make no sense at all <laughs> you're turning a tank into a big, right. <laughs> but a big yeah. clumsy running thing. <laughs> a tank that could trip and fall. That would be exactly. a great idea. Oh, well, that's brilliant. Right. Now, let's so, make them walk like a chicken. They're so cool, though, that I really wanted to write about them. I had to come up with a reason that they made sense, which took a while. But well, I mean uh, that's that's kind of part. I mean that's kind of part of why we do what we do, though, is because it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole, the whole idea, even as ludicrous as it might be, that's, that's the fantasy, man. That's, that's the, it would be so cool if this could be, you know, kind of like the whole kaiju giant robot movies or that Pacific Rim and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously not going to happen, but damn, it looked good on screen, right? <laughs> it was cool. I My favorite part is when they lift up the, uh, the kaiju or the, uh, the mechs with the helicopters in Pacific Rim. Right. Yeah, I just yeah. kind of drop them. I, I could never oh, figure out. Freaking helicopters, anyway. I'm pretty I, I sure could never really. figure out in Pacific Rim how the hell they got two people to do the same thing. Like, like, like wouldn't it just be easier for one person to control the robot instead of yeah. having two people stand side by side and, like, I don't know. You can't handle the neural load, man. Uh, that's it. I can't handle, handle the neural, neural, neural load. load. Have, you, have you talked to me? Come on. I can't do that, man. What are you doing? It's ice dancing with robots. That's exactly. <laughs> that's where they get their recruits from, is from like uh, oh, like swimming. I like that. I can create that genre. Ice, ice, dancing <laughs> ice dancing robots with tentacle porn in space. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like it. I like great. it. That's awesome. Uh, I see it's a robot. Chuck, I don't game. know if you were here when we were talking about our favorite aliens, um, but uh, we, oh. were, we were we were talking about aliens as a, as a kind of a big point in uh, space opera and mm -hmm. uh, done well. They can do really good things for your series. Mm -hmm. Done horribly, they can be the majority. They can be terrible. Uh, um, do you have a favorite alien and why? Mm. You can't say octopus because that's already been covered. Well, you know, Christie's already got it. You, uh, you, you ask that question immediately. My mind goes to Star Trek, Star Wars. Um, yep. And uh, in Star Trek, particularly, most of the aliens are going to be humanoids because that's what they had to work with uh, or special effects. Uh, I don't know. Favorite alien. Ooh. And it can't be the xenomorph. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Or the predator. I, in, uh, I always kind of from a just an interesting writerly standpoint culturally i always kind of thought that vulcans were kind of cool yes ah, the, that's two for two for vulcans the whole, the whole pure logic society thing was was i thought was just an interesting concept but um on the star wars side of the fence um i'm trying to remember what they were called no, it's a trap <laughs> <laughs> no not a, a, a kale <laughs> I think is what they were. Calamari. Oh, calamari. Yeah. Calamari. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, oh what? Trandoshans, I think. No, that's not right. The 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 ones that look like the big devils. Uh, and what are you talking about? Darth Maul? Cantina. No. I think there was one in the cantina scene, but they basically look like the the Christian devil. They have the horns coming off the head, and yeah, they was know, in the cantina scene, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Davronians, maybe I think is what they might have been called. But anyway, I, I read one of the expanded uh, universe uh, books one time, and it had one of those guys in it, and they kind of got into that culture and and how their race worked and stuff. And I remember really liking that. So yeah, I'm going to say Vulcans and Davronians. <laughs> Well, two for two for a Vulcan, Vulcan, a Davronian, and an R2 droid walking to a bar. <laughs> <laughs> we don't serve their kind. <laughs> it's funny how it tastes very because I never really liked the Vulcans. I you just know, thought I, the idea, you know, just like how would that work? How how would 
I mean, as a writer, how would I want, if I was going to tell a story about a Vulcan on Vulcan dealing in a, in a society where emotion was eschewed in favor of pure logic, I mean, how would you tell that story and make it engaging to human readers? You see what I'm well, saying? And that's, and that's why he made him a half Vulcan, made Spock was right, half Vulcan. Right. And, and you think about it, and like the reason I liked him was because I think they helped serve the story. And you think about Spock versus Captain Kirk, and he's a perfect foil right. you know, for him because all logic, all emotion, and you have the two of them that makes it you kind of make from between the two yeah, yeah it, makes, it makes the whole the whole thing work yeah but no i think you're absolutely right though about if you do your aliens correctly they can completely enrich a story you do them wrong and they're just these trite little things that got thrown in there for color you know yeah because i mean it's kind of like uh, just characters in general for a book like if you're if you're gonna if you're if you're gonna write a character centric book you really have to have like really good well-developed characters and if you're right you're writing a, a space opera and you're just going to have aliens just to have aliens. Um, like I'm actually guilty of this a little bit in my Terra Nova series. I needed to create some aliens, but I knew I wasn't going to have the space or the real estate to kind of engage and explore those aliens very well. I did one, um, one of the aliens I, I created, which was my uh, Bajoran alien <laughs> was the, the Zeiss. I like the Bajoran. Uh, I like the goat eyes. Yeah. The, the Zeiss in, in Terra Nova had goat eyes and like, Oh, that's right. right. on their forehead. Um, but then I created like um, there was the Lincini, which were like basically six legged reptile, almost look like the shadow creatures from Babylon five that they walk around, but not as mysterious. They look like um, like um, like ants and uh, crabs and um, like the Barathe, which is big, big, big bear aliens. But I had to create like all this, all these aliens that were going to be kind of backdrop to the story and didn't really. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, if I if I go back to the series at some point, maybe I can ex ex expand on on some of those uh, deals. But but you really have to kind of put some thought into if you're going to use them as a main character, like what what are their motivations, and are they like uh, human intrinsic human intrinsic motivations, or are they they completely alien, like like Morning Light Mountain? I put up a poll in the Facebook group, um, Facebook. Uh, dot com slash group slash keystroke medium if you're not there already what's your favorite alien species um go and vote i put a, a poll up there right now i think the challenge with writing oh, aliens as I, characters, I, point of view characters is to is you is you want to make them alien and not to not think like humans but if they're point of view characters at some point people have to understand what they're thinking so it's right important. yeah it's I just yeah. remembered one of my favorite aliens, and they're kind of just baddies. But in the uh, um, in the Galaxy's Edge, the the donkey, the, what, what what are they called? The, the, oh, the Z. In, it's in the second one is it the Z? Z H E E. I can't remember how they're pronounced, but they were like kind of donkey humanoids. I'm like, that's great. Yeah, they're running around with horse heads. I like that you brought up Babylon Five because it was something they did that I tried to emulate when I started my Brace Cordova books when I was doing the aliens because I'd never written uh spaceship spaceship -y science fiction before i started that series i'd always kind of done like cyberpunky stuff and when i started looking at creating aliens and that kind of thing i really liked if you go back and look at babylon 5 they didn't they they created their alien like characters but beyond that they created these whole cultures behind these characters that's the cool part yeah and that and and how those cultures integrated with the other cultures human whatever the other guys names were and um you know i think that if you want to do a good believable character you kind of need to do that as a writer before you pluck a character out of that culture and put them into your story because i think understanding their culture is going to help you understand what's going to motivate that character and give right. the reader a glimpse into that so they can understand that character's motivations and such. Cause like, like, uh, Vors, one of the guys in my book, I went back and created this whole, uh, matriarchal kind of system for them where the, the females of the species are kind of in charge and they stay on the home planet and they raise the kids and stuff. And the males go off and create what they call their legends. And these legends get sent back to the families and the families have these big like 
like how however big a story you can tell like if you go off and fight a war and all this other stuff and conquer terrible villains and make riches and da 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 your legend is bigger than this other seps legend and that's like a status thing for your sep so you've got these you've got these characters running around who are like looking for a way looking, looking for to, trouble looking for trouble basically looking for adventure looking for the the fortune and glory kid and uh and that's kind of what their their culture's based around. I even got so far into it as to say they don't they don't have like graveyards. They have funerary forests where they bury their dead, and a tree grows where they are. So oh, you go cool. into these big tree groves and pay homage to your ancestors and stuff. So I think if you do something like that, it can really help you get a handle on the character and make them help you really flesh them out as you're writing them in the stories. That's awesome. And Rick, and in, in I mean you've you've got. 26 books out and, and soon to be 28 um in in this series that we're talking about wholesale slaughter doesn't necessarily have aliens in it but i know you've written aliens before do you have a fa favorite alien that you have written that that it kind of sticks with you and that you'd like to either write more about or that is just your favorite that you've created well the main antagonist aliens in the birthright universe were the called the tawny and i wound up having one of them as a main character in a series and I didn't really think much about them at first, except as bad guys, because they were we fought a war against them, so it was they were the antagonists. But as I got more into writing inside this one's head and told actually told a book from his point of view, I kind of grew to like them more as as they grew as a a culture in my head. And uh, I'd like to go back to them at some point. That they, they um, I think one thing that. Uh, it's important to do, and Chuck was talking about it, when you when you come up with an alien species is not to make a monolithic. You mm. know, not not that every everyone from this one species thinks the same thing or believes right. the same thing or has the same attitude. Because I mean, look at humans. We have, you know, dozens yeah, of religions, dozens yeah. of languages. Yeah, you, yeah, you definitely have to think about what how do they treat their uh, their rebellious ones. Like with the example I was given, I, I thought, well, what if you had a female in that society that didn't want to stay home and, and she wanted to go out and look for, for the fortune and the glory and stuff? You know, how would they how would they react to that? You know, so you, you want it to you want it to be as realistic, realistic as possible, but at the same time still relatable. To the yeah. people, read, to the human beings that are going to be reading it, like the character in the, in the that I use as one of my protagonists in one of the series, he was uh, in the military during the war, and it was totally against not just their culture but their main religion to surrender. And yet, when he was faced with the proposition of all of his men being killed because they were totally outnumbered, well, men, his tawny, he surrendered. Which made him an outcast, an exile right. from his whole culture. Interesting. But not everybody hated him for it. You know, they understood right. just because right. just because the religion said you can't be part of us anymore. He still had friends and people that loved him. They just, you know, could yeah, very cling on. Well, I tried yeah. not to make them Klingons. I I was going more for Imperial Japanese mixed with. Sure, but it was oh, yeah. that same kind of die with honor warrior culture kind of thing. Yeah, I always wanted to get a batleth and have like batleth fights. <laughs> I think I could bring yeah. one to Vegas. Yeah, we Just should make around. Nerf bat batleth. No, 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 like a for real, legit, like razor sharp batleth. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure well, I don't know about Vegas, but in Kansas, you can carry that. And it's perfectly legal. Look, like all, I've 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 done a lot of research on this. Um, I know that you can just go into an airport and get on a plane um, with anything, as long as you tell them you're a limo driver. I've seen it before. I've seen it happen. <laughs> a limo driver. Uh, a limo driver. A limo driver. You, you tell them, look, Jim McCary told me. I saw it. Dumb and dumber. <laughs> okay. He's a limo driver. I had to explain it. It's all right. I'm a limo driver. Yeah. And I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. And I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. That's right. <laughs> Uh, you know, one thing that we didn't touch on, which I thought um, what would be kind of interesting to touch on really quick before we wrap up is um, uh, space travel, 
because we, we talked about kind of how space opera is awesome. on different planets and you know kind of a wide sweeping thing and uh peter f hamilton did it in uh with with like planet-based wormholes um but like david weber does it with uh uh well, the big waves what are they called gosh walshowski sails in uh right. in gravity in space. Well, yeah. um and then you have hyperspace and star wars you've got warp drive and in, in star trek and um folding space in the dune saga folding yeah. that's right do you guys i mean do you think this is necessary uh, technology to kind of um explore and is that something that is is necessary for your story do you in in this oh, yeah. type of story <laughs> Do we need to really define? Can we just say they went faster than light? Do they need to say that we we have these engines and this is how they work? What do you, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I, I think, think it, maybe back in the 30s and 40s or even 50s, you could get away with just saying, "Well, they went faster than light." Right. And not worry about it. But nowadays, people know you know you can't just go faster. People read science fiction. No, you can't just say, "Oh, we went faster than light." You have to give some explanation as to how you're breaking those rules. Right, right, right. I agree with that. And I, you know, I think it also, you, I think it comes down to knowing who you're writing to as well, because like, mm. like the stuff I do, the books are mostly there for the characters and the adventure and all that. So I give an explanation that yes, there's a hard, you know, energy matter barrier at, at light speed, but I came up with another way that they can kind of get around covering those great distances. And as long as there's enough of an explanation for the reader to go, okay, cool and then get on with the story, you're fine. But if you're writing to a more, uh, you know, hard science-y kind of crowd, you're going to have to work a little harder mm -hmm. and come up with something that's that's a lot more plausible. Also, you can work stuff like that into the plot. I mean, any faster than the drive you use should have some kind of limitations. So it's yeah, not just right. a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right. So I mean, it just depends on how much hand wavium that your readers are willing to accept. Well, you're like, you're, you're talking about kind of the difference between like, let's go to hyperspace in, in Star Wars, where they're just like, just, just go. We have hyperspace engines and poof, we go and like warp right. drive, they, like or warp drive. They kind of, uh, it, it's a little bit of hand waving, but a, a little bit more science. So then you have like the Alco Bieri drive in the, uh, the terms of enlistments, um, series or or uh, or even just wormhole generators a, a lot a lot of them though is they give it a scientific sounding name and a little bit of science right. but i mean let's face it none of it's see this is where the thing i think that you need it to move the story along and there's different mm. different things i think the dune one is probably the closest to being the fold space because you don't actually cross you bend the space and you just travel a small distance um unless you're writing a story that's like, you know, generational ships and all the things that happen during the generation ships. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is um, we get so hung up on hard science when I'm like, it's all, I had this argument with my son the other day. He's like, it's science. I'm like, it's not science. It's fantasy. It's straight <laughs> it's fantasy. True. Any space travel is straight fantasy. Nobody can even come close to explaining right. real it's science. Speculation. It is all hand wavium. It's just a different level of hand wavium. Depends on what you're willing to accept. And actually, James McCormick has a really good point here. It expands, handles it pretty well. It's still kind of out there um, in, in the realms of probably not plausible, but uh, I had never thought of spaceship design uh, the way they thought about it with uh, the way they did gravity because their, yeah. their, ships, yeah. are, their ships are based, uh, you know, they're still... Um, horizontally they based flip around look at yeah, them, they still seem seem so horizontal, but they're actually not horizontal they're actually vertical yeah because that yeah, I, go, I go into that a lot in, in the books that i have where they don't have artificial gravity is everything mm -hmm. everything's organized vertically yeah yeah you have gravity from accelerating or you have gravity from decelerating. that's that's really awesome but the other thing the expanse does that handles a lot of the problem i'm being so cynical about is that they don't go that far it's mostly in our solar system right yeah. whereas really in a lot of science fiction you're going like halfway across the galaxy which even yeah. at 10 times the speed of light would take you five thousand years or whatever the math is i i prefer uh julie Julia's and uh, consistently Christie's uh, answers to the, the the question here is space magic. Absolutely, it's yeah. all space magic. It's well, it can be, it can be space like, magic, but if you're going to write a good uh, science fiction story, it's got to have its own rules, and you have to stay consistent. Right. Just like fantasy, sure. you make rules and stick to them, but it's still fantasy. Or like, like Blast, we're talking about uh, 
We're talking about plasma blasters. There's a great YouTube video on, on what it would take to make a plasma blaster. And basically you have to have like, you know, five, three mile Island nuclear reactors mm-hmm. to make one yeah. shot of your pistol. <laughs> and there's it. no way you could ever carry it. Uh, you, you know, all, all of, all of the blaster technology, the plasma blasters is all so far fictional that it's just ridiculous. It's, it's fantasy. Right. So I'm probably shooting myself foot now. Nobody's ever read my books anymore. But... <laughs> I, I would agree that it's fantasy. It's, it's speculative science. It's, I mean, it's nothing we can do now. But, but if the exact same I, think, rule. I think you have to believe in one thing we don't know have any way to do, which can make the stuff possible. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. It's the same thing as in fantasy. You make a rule, you follow it. I say that you can go through wormholes, and people believe me because um, that's the story rule. But it's still not science. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a dick. Sorry. Basically, basically science-ish. It's science-ish. Yeah. It's science-ish fiction. Call it whatever, call whatever, call whatever, you, whatever they want. On a scientific basis. I mean, actual physicists come up with you know ways that they could exist. They don't know if they do or yeah, if it's possible right. they do, but they they've come up with the math for it. Yeah. The, the, the but I mean, as long as you can come like up with five million years to go any place. As long as you can come up. Jerry Pornell and and Larry Niven when they wrote uh, the. Codominium stories, which had starships, they went to uh, Kip Thorne, who was a Caltech physics pr- professor, and had him work out the physics of their their star drive to make sure that they didn't break any rules of physics with it. I mean, they might they might have made up a couple, but they didn't break any. Right. And, uh, it's 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 stuff that might exist, but we have no idea if it does, and maybe we never will. Yeah. But, or, or or things like time dilation, which I'm not real strong on but any of our space opera stories would have a huge problem with time dilation because when you came home it would be 50,000 years in the future or well if you're going faster than light through space it would actually be in in the past yeah because going faster than light is the same is or you become energy space, is the same thing as as going backwards in time or or you become pure energy and I, I liked what uh, what they did in Star Trek, where they were like warp ten. Once you go to warp ten, it's like an infinite speed, and then you become like one with the universe. And like shit, the crazy stuff happens, and you're like, ah, he, he went warp ten, and now he's turning alien. Chuck, what were you going to say earlier? You're going to say something about it. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, we talk about all these different things about how it's 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 theoretical or or plausible or speculative or whatever. But from just strictly from a storytelling standpoint, as long as you can come up with something that makes the reader go, oh, okay, maybe, you know, I think you're golden. You know, you can get on with your story. Like in my case, I talk, my my main character is kind of a history buff. And I had him recollect one time about how they discovered, uh, you know, millennia before the, the timetable of the story he talked about them finding the go exploring space and finding the first uh, new elements and expanding the, you know, what eventually became the first periodic table expansion. And then the third, you know, as they got further out in space and each of these new elements were like the basis for their new technologies and then meeting other races added to that and so on. And so as long as you can give some kind of plausible explanation for why you have a ship that can fold space and jump that way, or why you have a drive that can make you go this fast or whatever, from a writer standpoint and a reader standpoint, you know, as long as the readers are happy with that, with that plausibility, I think, I think you're golden and you don't, you know, I, I really don't think you have to sweat that that much. Yeah. I agree, and I, I'm I'm kind of being difficult, but I just I find it inter, an interesting point of discussion is all that oh, that, I, that yeah. people because it's it's like well I'm 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 better than fantasy because I'm reading science. Well, man, don't. I'm reading science. <laughs> don't don't feed the trolls, dude. Uh, I mean, you know, there's always going to be people who just want to say jerk. my shit's better than your shit just because it's my shit. Well, you know? First of all, we only we only feed the trolls on Tuesdays around here, so <laughs> can't feed them on Mondays. Uh, so let's bring all this to a a circular close here. <laughs> um, we talked about aliens and and space travel and all these things. What do you guys think is the number one? If you're wanting to break into the and write space opera, we're going to go around the room. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to get in, if an author is looking at writing space opera and writing good space opera with the amount of reading and, and knowledge that we have in the room, what do you think is the number one thing they need to work on and focus to make a really good space opera book? Good characters. Hmm. It's any book. You stole my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like saying what's the best thing that ever happened to you all the day my kids were born yeah you know? <laughs> not true actually Thank but, you no, but, it's a, but it's absolutely true you got to have strong characters you know you got to be able to to write strong engaging characters um and i and i honestly for space opera specifically i think you know some good world building is essential because you've you're going to have to have some really interesting shit for these characters to do. So I, I would say, I agree with Rick. First thing is solid characters for anything when you write. Uh, but secondly, I think world building is a little extra important to space opera. Hmm. I think so too. Peter Hamilton sure believes that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I think those are all good points. And I think uh, contrary to my, all my ranting is that, you know, you have to have parameters in the story that, raise the stakes so you can use your your science to define define what you can do and um like i said like rick said earlier they 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 can't just like cheat because these are the rules of of this book and um there's consequences they got to make hard choices good characters in interesting settings making impossible choices Within a within a bound set of limitations, is what yeah, and, saying, and, right? and taking care of the people that matter to them, I think, is really huge in all storytelling. If if your if your characters aren't heroic and they don't make sacrifices for the people they care about or the ideals right. they stand for, then it's kind of not not as good. I don't think. I think James McCormick actually brought up a, one one good uh, point on 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 looking at story. Uh, Firefly is actually a really good space opera that um, doesn't mm-hmm. have aliens in it um sure. and it, it's almost kind of like the expanse yeah. in the way that they, they only have um one system then they're, they're not uh, a multi-system uh civilization it's just one and they don't really even expand on what that system is it's just out yeah. well, in, the, in the movie they kind of talk about dozens of worlds and hundreds of planets. i want to see what system that is because that's right exactly. <laughs> um so uh, yeah yeah, I, I I agree with with all that. The character number one, obviously, the world building number two, um, and and not not creating, um, car. I think a lot of people get caught up in the vast and and epic scale, but not creating so much cardboard characters. Like if you if you're if you're going to create some alien civilizations, uh, take some time and and actually kind of create something fun and new and exciting um i think a lot of people create aliens as as villains as a good backdrop um and um a lot of people kind of go what what peter f hamilton did with morning light mountain making them completely unrelatable but for kind of ridiculous reasons um like like they just don't like us because we're we're human or whatever like just for for a simplistic reason um but i think if you're definitely looking at, at writing space opera i mean d- d- definitely check out pierre f hamilton's work um uh as, as it comes to a, a grand scale if you're looking at smaller scale um definitely the expanse is a good place to start probably too um if you're looking at watching i would always recommend babylon 5 like 100 percent, i would recommend yeah. babylon 5 uh, as, a, as a um you know because it, babylon 5 was written for the series like it was written for the the arc um so they the michael j or j michael straczynski he actually knew what he was doing from the beginning and he, actually it, it takes about half a season to really kind of uh season one half of season one starts the yeah. arc um so you, you can you watch season one but only the, the last half of season one really starts that arc and then it carries through two three and four and I don't know that I've ever watched season five, but you can watch through yeah. season one and season four and skip really the last episode of five. Skip skip the last episode or all but the last episode. All but the last episode. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a lot of we should have a fluff. five season watch party for Babylon Five. Honestly, I, I love Babylon Five. Like it's yeah. it's it's uh Babylon Five and Battlestar Galacta are, are, are the two my go to um TV shows when it when it comes and, and but Battlestar Galactica is not really space opera. It's more of a male sci-fi deal. But uh, um, 
I, I I left that poll in the Facebook group. What's your favorite aliens? Um, let us know too in that thread. What's your favorite space opera series, and what you would recommend to anybody looking to either read or write in the genre? Um, it and it's been a great episode tonight. A hundred and or uh, an hour and twenty minutes. We've we've been flying really by, kind of cooking tonight, and uh, always great conversation. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Uh, it was great having you. I think, except, except for Rick's awesome, so I think the pre-show stories is really <laughs> <gave us> the <laughs> energy. That's and not the candles. suitable for work, man. That's to make, right. to make <laughs> NSFW. I'm going to scrub that out of my brain. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, people start not showing up for the pre-show. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, that's the one you don't show up for the pre-show. Now, that's when I start calling people five minutes before we go live. Like, hello. We just didn't want to hear those stories, so we thought we'd come in at the last minute. Uh, everybody that came in and hang out with us live, thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with us on a Monday night. Great live chat. Uh, great live chat. Uh, consistently, Christy, welcome back. I pay attention. A lot of people think I don't pay attention, but I pay attention who's in the live chat. Um, uh, let's see. What Thursday. What did, what did Lauren and Kayleen have going on Thursday? Let's see. Let's look at the calendar and see if there's something interesting. Last uh, last Thursday, they had Kevin J. Anderson talking about Which dictation. Was brilliant. Fantastic episode. If you've ever looked at wanting to do um, dictation in your fiction, Kevin J. Anderson is, is probably the, the go-to uh, person when it comes to that because he just walks around and uh, talks his story into this recorder um and, and that's how he writes all his novels let's see uh, approaching subject matter experts with walt robillard is this thursday um that'll be a good show because walt knows his shit when it comes to um like the military technology and a whole bunch of other stuff like that uh spec ops community Whew, man he knows what he's talking about check out that show and uh, Tuesday, uh, today's Monday, so tomorrow's Tuesday, which means there's going to be another episode of Ask the Editor. If you guys have never watched uh, Ask the Editor with Ellen Campbell and Walt Robillard, uh, great, great resource for writers uh, if you're looking for um, ways to improve your writing craft. And next week, we're going to be talking about uh, collabs. Uh, and um, we've had several, actually, we have had several collab conversations on the show we're going to bring in a couple of uh, guests hosts on uh, monday james s aaron will be here uh, lisa richmond uh, who's a longtime fan of the show she will be here um gosh now i lost the list there's gonna be a couple of us i think there's gonna be five total we're gonna be talking about collabing um pros cons ways of doing it that kind of thing uh i think it's gonna be a good show um so if you're interested in that come back on monday and we're gonna be talking about some reading we're going to be talking about some writing and, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. You guys have a great Monday. Bye. Peace.